now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We head out west in the adventures of Red Rider this hour. This episode of the program was originally broadcast on May 7th, 1942. And uh, this episode is entitled, Trouble in Roaring River. From out of the west comes Red Rider, America's famous fighting cowboy. That pony little beaver, there's trouble in Roaring River. Let's hit the trail and find out what's up now. You betcha, Red Rider. Get along. Get him up. Get going, Thunder. Hit that trail. Come on, Thunder. The Adventures of Red Rider. Save Devil's Hole depositors all the money they had entrusted to Kirby, Red Rider was getting ready to help the Duchess on Spring Roundup when he received a letter from old Eli Corbin begging Red to come to his ranch in Roaring River before it was too late. Thus, as we join Red Rider, we find him galloping along on the indomitable thunder with Little Beaver racing his pinto close by his side. We got a much further to go yet, Red Rider. Ten, twelve miles, I should judge, Little Beaver. Corbin's spread lies just over that far ridge. Mm. We think a mighty funny, Mr. Corbin, no ride and say just what kind of trouble he expecting. When a man doesn't ride it down, you can bet it's the kind of trouble he doesn't like to think about. Trouble like gun feuds. Mm. Gun feud? Maybe then we better speed him up ponies, on Red Rider. Now you're talking, Little Beaver. Let's see you prod that pinto. We prod him okay. Get him up, Papoos. Get him moving. Lay on to it, fella. We gotta make Corbin's range. Come on, thunder! Pixie, I'm in no mood for arguing with a gal, even though she is my daughter. Oh, but, Dad, Red Rider should be here soon. Well, of course, Red will be here. I sent for him, didn't I? But as sure as my name is Elihu Carbon, I've stood enough from Bash Fenton, and I'm going up there and tell him so. Now! Oh, Dad, if you'd only wait. Take someone with you. Oh, I'm through waiting, Dixie. From now on, it's going to be Fenton's way of doing things or mine. Come on, now, let go of that horse. If you do go, promise me you'll not lose your temper. Ah, you're a fine one to talk, Dixie Corbin. Why, you've got more temper than 50 ordinary gals put together. Uh -oh. now, now, stand away. I'm leaving. And if Ryder comes, why, you make him to home. Get up, Dan. Huh? Get Oh, Dad. Dad, please be careful. And I tell you, I'm through molesting them settlers. When they first moved in here, I thought maybe you were right about them taking the grazing lands us old-time cattlemen need. Well, I'm still right, Corbin. Oh, no, you're not. You're just using that as an excuse to rustle their steers and rob the corrals and seal them blind. Yeah? Well, what if I am? What are you going to do about it? You're in this too, you know. No, you mean I was in. But unless you swear you let up on them nesters, I'm going down to the sheriff and telling the truth. Do you really think I'd let you? You try and stop me. Go on. Old as I am, I'll take my chances of the maverick like you. Yes, and with my bare hands. Why, you locoed old... You can't stand up like a man, can you? You... Get off, you old wildcat. 
Let go. Let go of my neck. Yeah. Yeah. Let go. Try and stop me, will you? Threaten me, huh? Well, there. Yeah, by the time you wake up, Bash Fenton, I'll be at the sheriff's. So long, I'll see you in jail. See me in jail, will you? Well, I'll see you in Boot Hill first. Mitch! Bandy! Fill your saddle holsters and get ready to ride! Whoa! Hold it, boys! Oh. This will be far enough. You think the old coot's really heading for the sheriff, Bash? Yeah. Corbin don't change his mind once it's made up. But heading for the sheriff and getting there is two different things. This is a good spot. <laughs> we can see the road and he can't see a thing through them rocks. Get your rifles ready. Corbin should be coming along soon on his last ride to town. <laughs> Getting tucked, little beaver? No, me not tired, Red Rider. Pony get him tired from fast run. Well, in that case, suppose we rain up here for a minute and let Papoose catch his breath. Mm. Right, easy, Thunder. Mm. Oh, boy. Oh, Papoose. Sure get a mighty pretty panorama, this valley from here. Mm. Can see maybe 20 miles. Keep nice ranch country. You bet. Maybe one day when you get married, we'll settle up here in Roaring River. Mm. Me no get him, squaw. Me fight him brave. Red Rider, oh, look him across valley. Three men with rifle. Darned if there aren't. And from the looks of them, they're getting ready to dry gulch someone. Mm, you betcha him dry gulch. Well, see, one man ride him down and rode all alone. Darned if that doesn't look like old man Corbin. Little Beaver, it is Corbin. And we're at least mm. a good mile away. Rake that pony. We've got to try and break it up. Get him up, Papoose. Get him, Clyde. Get it. Stretch him out, old fella. There's a man's life at stake. Come on, Thunder. Good partner, stretch those legs. Come on, Thunder. Red Rider, Red Rider, Bushwhacker, see him, us. Look. Bless those murders, they're ready to shoot. Corbin, Eli Corbin, watch out. They shoot him, Mr. Corbin, right and back. Those low down rascals, come on. No, you shoot him, six gun, Red Rider. When they got him, too much head start. Oh, Thunder, oh. If I ever see them Bushwhackers again, I'll put my brand on them for good. Come on, little beaver. We better get Corvin and take him back to his ranch. <laughs> there, now, I know there isn't much to say, Miss Dixie, but crying won't bring your dad back. Those foul killers. I'll pay him back bullet for bullet, ten lives for one. Now, just going out and starting a gun feud, miss, is no cure for trouble. They started it. I knew they would. I told Dad. Who started it? You mean you know? Oh, who else could it have been but Bash Fenton and those gun hands of his? Mm, we'd not know him, Bash Fenton. That'll be enough, little beaver. Fenton's a man who got the ranchers together when the homesteaders moved in. First off, we thought he was right, but later Dad found out Fenton was only using the honest ranchers as a front so he could steal everything the settlers had. That sounds reasonable. I've known critters like Fenton before, but can you prove it? Prove it? We know what is not enough. I'm afraid not. Judges want evidence, not guesswork. Who said anything about judges? No Corbin ever needed a judge when he knew he was right. And if you think I'm going to sit here and let Fenton do any more killing, you're on the wrong ranch, Mr. Ryder. I never argue, Miss Dixie, especially with a lady. So now, how about you going inside now and resting a bit? Maybe we can talk more later. I will go in now, but, but don't you ever think you can talk me out of what I've, I've decided on. And if you're not man enough to help me, then perhaps you better go back where you come from. Hmm. That Missy, she got him temple like bonfire. She sure has. And like with a bonfire, if the wind's blowing against her, she's almost certain to get burned. Come well, on, let's go up on the porch, little beaver. I got some tall thinking to do. You still think him, Red Rider? Uh-huh. Hmm, what you think, um? I'm thinking how I can smoke out those coyotes that gun down Eli Corbin before Miss Dixie gets herself into real trouble. Hmm, Miss Dixie, she say man named Fenton do. Yeah, I've heard of Fenton. He's got a reputation from Abilene to Santa Fe and none of it's good. But a Jasper like that has generally had too much experience to be caught easy. You catch him plenty other bad men, 
But maybe you don't know how to tie him down good, huh? That's about the size of a little bit. Well, looks like we got a visitor there, riding in through the gate. Well, why did him look him like men? We chased him this afternoon. Looking like him and proving he is him is where we've got our job. Howdy, mister. Something we can do for you? Why, yes. Miss Corbin home? Yeah, she's home, but she's not seeing anyone right now. I'll be glad to give her your name. Fenton, cowboy. Bash Fenton. Oh. Never seen you on the Corbin spread before. You new here? Sort of. I just rode in today. Got here just when the pool cats, that dry gulch Mr. Corbin, shot him in the back. Oh. You mean you saw who they were? I can't honestly say I know exactly who they were. But if I ever find them, they'll always remember Red Rider. Red Rider, huh? So you're the strawberry blonde with a great reputation. Reputations are something you'd know about, Fenton. And as for the hair, I don't admire it being described as strawberry blonde. Why, some of the prettiest gals I ever knew were strawberry blondes. You got hair where women would give a lot for. Yeah, Fenton. Well, I've got eyes, too. That's more important. Eyes and an awful good memory. Something tells me you're trying to say something, Ryder. But I'm not much of a hand at reading between the lines. Supposing I put it this way. Eli Corbin was one of my oldest friends. I'm staring, staying here in Roaring River until I find the Jaspers who shot him. And Fenton, I don't expect to stay here very long. No, Red. I don't think you will stay very long. That is not up and walking around. You may be wrong about that, Bash. I figure I'm perfectly safe walking around just as long as my face is toward you. What happens if I say I don't like your face? I'm an accommodating sword, Fenton. I'd offer you a chance to change my face. That is, if you said you didn't like it. All right, then I am saying it. And I'm saying this, too. We got no room in Roaring River for your kind, so pack up and clean out of here. Not before I... Oh, no, Fenton. Keep your hand right above your belt. Now, come on, get it up. Yeah? Who do you think you're giving orders to, you sidewinding, lily-livered... Look right, you uh... watch him. All right, Bash, we'll play it your way. Make your draw. That's just what I am doing. Oh. You fool... You think you can get away because you were lucky and hit my gun? I'm not trying to get away, Fenton. I'm right here, waiting. What was that? Red, who did that shooting? Oh. Fenton. And you have the nerve to come here. Red Ryder, turn it around quick. I'll show you. Uh, still got to learn your lesson, huh, Fenton? I never will like that face of yours, so... Go get him, Red Ryder. Spank him. Good. All right, little beaver. Right straight now. Uh, Good work, Red. I wish I'd have done it myself. Well, I'm glad I could save you the effort, Miss Dixie. He's a little more my size. That doesn't stop me. Well, I've got something that'll stop both of you. And I'll be using it. In that case, Bash, here. Take your pop gun. You'll be needing that if you try anything else. Now go on. Hit that horse and hightail out of here. Red, what are you doing? You're not going to let Fenton leave here, are you? I'd hate to contaminate the place by keeping him. Well, don't worry about me. I'll be back sooner than you expect. Get out. What sort of a friend are you, Red Rider? I thought you were a man. Well, never mind. Fenton doesn't scare me. I'll go after him and bring his skin back full of holes. Now, hold on, miss. You're not going anyplace. Yes, I am, and I'm going right now. Now, Miss Dixie, I told you I hate to argue with a lady. Ah, no, hold still. Let go of me! Let go of me! You coward! Hold me here while that murder and Fenton gets away. Take your hands off of me! Now, miss, I'm plumb sorry. I can't oblige you. But your dad was too good a friend of mine to let his daughter stick a head in a noose. <laughs> there. I hope I didn't hurt you. But even if I did, I saved you from being hurt worse. I don't want your sympathy or your apologies. We Corbin never needed any outside help, and I guess I'll manage to square this account without you. Now, please, Keep Mr. quiet. Said and done enough already. The only thing left for you to do is to pack up and get out of here. Go on, did you hear? I said get out! But you... All right, little beaver. Let's get our things. There are other ways than suicide to even up Corbin's death, and I hope we can do it before what's left of his family is wiped out. We return to the adventures of Red Rider in just a moment. May 7, 1942, Red Rider on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Classic Radio Theater on your favorite station, May 7, 1942, Red Rider.
rejoining Red Rider and Little Beaver, we find them camping out in Indian Meadows after being ordered off the Corbin Ranch by Corbin's hot-headed daughter, Dixie. More bacon, Little Beaver? No, no, thank you, Red Rider. Me eat them plenty. Hey, now, is that you? Since when did you ever have enough to eat? No, have enough. But while we sit here, eat supper, maybe Miss Dixie, she gets self into trouble. Right you are, Little Beaver. The thing for us to do is pack up and start riding. No telling what Fenton is up to now. Fenton, you're going to let me out of this. I didn't reckon on no killings when I threw in with you. Yeah? Well, you're in. Just the way old man Corbin was in. Bash, I'm warning you. Either let me out of this or... or... Yeah, or what? You wouldn't want to be found on the road to the sheriff's office with slugs in your back, would you? Would that be any worse than swinging for killings you got me into? I'd rather take my chances with you. That's just what you're going to do. And what's more, you're not leaving here, Jackman. Hear me? You're not... The... What's that? Mitch, Bandy, where them footsteps coming from? Right from here, Fenton. Don't go for that gun. That's better. If you're looking for your men, they won't be coming to for a long time. Are you, are you crazy or something coming here like this? Far from it. For the first time, I do know what I am doing. Oh, where's that red-headed bodyguard you got? Outside? Ryder? Yeah. You'll never see him bodyguarding me. He's got skim milk or red blood ought to be. Now, let's get busy, Fenton. Open up that safe. Safe? Oh, so that's what you've turned into. Old man Corbin's daughter. Nothing but a stick-up outlaw. Bash, if I ever hear my father's name in your mouth again, so help me, they'll be your last words. You understand? All right, now get that safe open. I'm getting enough money from you to get out and start over again. Because I know Roaring River would never be safe with the two of us here. Now get. All right. But remember, we got laws in this country. The only laws you know are those you break. You stand there, Mr. Jackman. Nice and still. Sure, Dixie. Sure. Here you are. Everything that was in the safe. I'd say thank you, Fenton, if I didn't know the money never was yours. Now look. If I was you, I'd stay right there, nice and comfortable, till you're sure I've made my getaway. I still have a feeling, Fenton, that you'd be better off dead. Jackman, come on, don't stand there, you fool. Jackman, are you lighting out after that gal with me? No, Bash. I told you I'm through. Yeah? Well, I was wondering how I could take care of you without having a trace to me, but now I know. Well, well, what do you mean, Fenton? Oh, when the you... folks in town want to know who shot Jackman, I'm telling them Dixie Corbin did it. <laughs> That's right. I'm saying you were a hero, tried to save my money, and she shot you for your trouble. Bash! Bash, no! Now, Miss Corbin, let me see you get out of this one. <laughs> Sheriff, you needn't take my word for it. She even crawled up behind Mitch and Bandy and knocked them out. Darn it all, Fenton, it don't make sense. Dixie Corbin's got a hot temper, but she's no killer. Sheriff, if you're hankering to keep your job, you'll find Dixie Corbin. When it comes to proving what she did, I'll be there with witnesses. I don't doubt that, Fenton. Ryder. Ryder. And your witnesses will lie almost as bad as you. Ryder, I've been itching to square a few things with you. Ryder, watch him. He's grabbed a crowbar. <laughs> Try again, Fenton. Maybe places will help your aim. You... <laughs> now... Now I've got to just what I want to, Ryder. Oh, gouge my eyes, will you? That ain't half what I'm going to do to you. Ryder, try and turn around. I can't get him off of you the way you're laying. Oh, well, me can do him, Sheriff. Me can fix him, Benton. Give me chance. Turn him a little more, Red Ryder. Little Beaver, stay out of this. Oh, no. Me and him now is good. Watch. Wee! Me knock him out. Well, doggone you, Little Beaver. You were mighty kind to hit him with that chair. But I didn't need your help. <laughs> We know him, Red Rider. You beat him, okay? Only me get him confident and anyhow. Him really snake. Kind thing. Attack right in the sheriff's office. Well, Sheriff, what are you going to do? What'd you like me to do, Fenton? Lock Ryder and this singeing grasshopper up in a charge of... with intent to kill, that's what. And while you're about it, Sheriff, make an assault and battery twice. I will, Mr. Fenton, a little this afternoon. All right, Fenton. You better clean out and get to Joe's restaurant for a piece of beefsteak for your eye before they close. But what about Ryder and that Corbin girl? I know what to do about Ryder. All right, Sheriff. But no matter what happens, I want that girl brought in to justice. She'll be brought to justice, Fenton, along with a lot of other people. But one of them won't be you, Ryder, because you'll be six feet under. Sheriff, do you think she shot down Jackman? No, Red. I take my oath she never did. Good. In that case, how about forgetting the lockup for me and pinning a deputy's badge on my shirt? Deputy's badge? Yep. 
If you want me to bring in Dixie Coop, and I've got to have some legal authority. <laughs> Ryder, you're a man after my own heart. Here's the badge. Now get to work. Thanks, Sheriff. Now, if you'll just let word out I'm deputized to bring in Miss Corbin, I might be able to help you clean up this whole county. Right. Come on, little beaver. We've got to find Dixie's hideout before Fenton locates it and closes in for the kill. May 7th, 1942, Reed Hadley as Red Rider on this edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these messages from your favorite radio station. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better. Mike Lindell and MyPillow launching the MyPillow 2.0. Now, when Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he's discovered a new technology that makes MyPillow even better. Of course, the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, but now with brand new fabric with a temperature-regulating thread, it's the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. Say goodbye to tossing and turning and flipping your pillow over in the middle of the night. And more great news on the MyPillow 2.0. Buy one, get one free offer with my promo code Wyatt. MyPillow 2.0 is 100% made in the USA, 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square to receive the MyPillow 2.0, buy one, get one free offer, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion now, The Adventures of Red Rider, May 7th, 1942. All right, you bitch! It's me, Miss Dixie, Larry! Oh, what'd you find out in town, Larry? Plenty! You know what? A red-headed cowboy got himself made deputy, and he's out looking for you. Red Rider? Why, that smart... Oh, that I'm kind of glad. They give me a chance to pay him back for the way he manhandled me when I wanted to go after Fenton this afternoon. You say the word, miss, and me or any of the other waddies who work for you will fatten right her up with lead. No, I don't want that unless I can't help it. But if it means choosing between me be ta- being taken back on that trumped-up murder charge or Mr. Ryder, well, you know what to do. Yes, miss. Then do it now, son, because I'm right behind you. Fred, what... How did you get here? Sorry, miss, this is no social call. I'm here as an officer of the law. Oh! So it'll save being noisy if you and your puncher just unbuckle those belts and drop them to the ground. And you had the nerve to call yourself a friend of my father's. That's better. A little beaver ride hurt on that artillery. Uh, me do, I'm Red Rider. Uh, Dixie, if I were your brother, know what I'd do? I'd just reach over and pin your ears back. If I had a brother, he'd have yours back and Fenton and Boot Hill, too. Now, look, you've gotten yourself in a mess playing your own hand. Now, let me try and help you. You help me. Why should I? You're wearing that tin badge. I know what you want. Right, you, Dixie. I'm doing what I'm doing because Eli Corbin was... Well, he meant almost as much to me as he did to you. If you listen instead of talking, I think I know how we can get you out of this and Fenton where he belongs. Well, keep talking. With you hiding out, Fenton's happy. He can gun you down and nothing could be said about it. But if you were caught and brought into town, he'd be through. How do you figure? Now, look. If we get word to Fenton that I've caught you and I'm bringing you in, he'll try and stop us before we get to town just to save his own hide. And if he does, that's all the chance I want. All right. All right. I hope you know what you're doing. Now you're talking. Little Beaver? Yes, Red Rider. Hit that pinto of yours and head for town. I want Fenton to find out that I'm bringing Miss Dixie in on the sawmill road. Uh, Me rather, Red Rider. And me be back in time to give you plenty help. Good boy. Get him up, Papoose. Get him along. Get! (laughs) That's a good one, Bass. You're sure that... Hey... Here comes Red Ryder's engine kid. Well, mister, mister, anybody see him, Sheriff? Sheriff? Why? What's the matter? Red Ryder sent me to tell Sheriff him catch him Dixie Corbin. The dickens he did. Where's Ryder now? Well, him drive him on Sawmill Road, Miss Dixie horse hurt, and both ride him on Thunder. Well, I'll tell you what. The Sheriff went home. He lives about seven miles the other side of town. You mm. can't miss it. He's a big white house. Now, you better mosey along and tell him the good news. Uh, you betcha. Me tell him. Me tell him quick. Hey, what's the idea of sending the kids seven miles out of town? You know the Shut sheriff. up, you fool. 
The last thing I want is for the sheriff to find out and for that girl to get to town. Oh. Come on, round up the men and let's head for Sawmill Pass before we're all swinging from trees. <laughs> Bash, look. That must be him now. Down the fell in the gale riding double on a horse. Yeah. Well, the only thing that horse will be carrying back to town is his saddle. Come on, men. Ride him down. All right, you two. Rich. Bash Fenton, what do you want? You and that red-headed catamount, Ryder. Hey, that's Larry Clark riding with her. Where is Ryder? Where is he anyway? Right here, Fenton. Right behind you. Why, you low down. Get him, boy. Larry, get the other two. I'll get Bash. There, try and get away with you. Got enough, Fenton, or do you want more? No, no, no. I've got enough. I quit, Ryder. I'm through. And you'll tell who killed Jackman and Eli Corbin? Sure, sure. I'm licked. I did. All right. I got them both. All right. Let's tie them all up and head for town. The jail's been swept out and it's ready. Red. Shh, Dixie, this job's not done yet. We've got to lock them up and turn the money you took over to the state. Get my horse, little beaver. We've got to ride. Red, won't you stay, please? With Dad gone, I need a real man to run the place. Larry's man enough. He proved that. And now with Fenton and his gang gone, things should be more pleasant. Well, little beaver, how about heading for home? Oh, yippee. We like him home for change. Get him up, Papoose. Get him. So long, everyone. Come on, boys. Start running. Come on. Come on, Thunder. Nice and peaceful like again at the Corbin Ranch, and it wasn't an easy assignment for Red Rider and Little Beaver to get the goods on Bash Fenton, and at the same time, tame Little Dixie Corbin. But now, with everything under control, Red Rider and Little Beaver ride for Painted Valley Ranch, where they find the Duchess and her neighbor accusing each other of rustling cattle. So listen again next time for Red Rider, America's famous fighting cowboy. May 7th, 1942, Red Rider on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater, we start a brand new Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story. This five-part story, part one tonight, The Silver Blue Matter, originally broadcast May 7th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Dean, Johnny, mono guarantee. Oh, hiya, Ralph. How are things? Rough. My wife could kill me, Johnny. For the insurance? No, just for kicks, because she's mad, because she wanted a mink coat. In short, she's a woman. I couldn't buy her a mink. I don't make that kind of money. You know how it is in the insurance game. Oh, sure, I know, Ralph. You're down to your last yetch. So what happens yesterday? I lose 80 mink coats, silver blue, worth $100,000. Gone, snatched, disappeared. Warehouse robbery? Check. Bandley Furriers out in Los Angeles. My wife's about to blow her stack. She says if I can't afford one fur coat for her, then how come I can pay for 80 of them that I haven't even got? How do you reason with a woman, Johnny? I never try. Usually I just send flowers. I've already done that. She ran them through the garbage disposer. So now what do I do? Buy some more flowers. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Mono Guarantee Insurance Company, 4312 Spring Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Silver Blue matter. <laughs> Item 1, $152.40, telephone and incidentals and transportation to Los Angeles. I called the Mono Guarantee agent out there before I left and got a brief rundown on the case. Among other things, I learned that a man I'd known and worked with before, Detective Lieutenant Raymond Garcia, had been put in charge. 
And with Garcia on hand, I knew I could count on cooperation by the police. But I still wasn't expecting quite as much as I got. I knocked over the fur joint myself, Johnny. Can I see you? Only way we get to see you. How have you been? Overworked, underpaid, frustrated, disillusioned, unappreciated. In other words, fine. <laughs> got your luggage yet? Uh, it's coming right there. Good. We ought to get moving. I've got a squad car outside. What's all the rush? We've got a guy downtown in the hospital I figured you'd want to talk to. Well, he'll wait, won't he? He'd probably like to, if he had any choice. He's dying? Kind of looks that way. He's one of the two night watchmen the gang slugged when they broke into the warehouse. And he's our big one, Johnny. He's all we've got. Has he been able to talk? A couple of sentences during the night. He's got to talk. What do you mean? He's the only one who got a look at them. When he did talk, what did he say? Gibberish, mostly. He did say one thing, though. They were kids. Just a gang of kids. Oh, that's going to make it rougher. Yeah, in a lot of ways. What do you mean? You'll find out later, Johnny. Come on, let's go. We took the freeway into town with the accelerator floorboarded and the siren screaming. Racing against time and against dying. Weaving in and out through the four-wheel madness that Los Angeles calls traffic. And then the other side of the coin. The solemn quiet of hospital corridors. The calm voices of the nurses. And the blank hardness of sterile white walls. We sat there beside a bed and waited for a man to talk or to die. But the slow minutes passed, and he still didn't either. So we waited. Guess that shot the doctor gave him is not going to have any effect. Apparently not. It's a crazy world, Johnny. No, just the people in it. I mean, yesterday, we'd never even heard of this guy. I still don't know his name. And 24 hours later, here we are. A couple of strangers sitting around watching him die. Yeah, it's here on his chart at the head of the bed. Albert Christmas. Strangers. Not even family or friends. He didn't have any family or friends. He lived alone in a furnished room. Worked alone, too, except for one partner. So, a gang of punks jump him and bust his head open. Dude, I'm a bad cop, Johnny. I get sentimental about things like this. How'd they work it, Garcia? It's a warehouse district. The streets are practically deserted at night. A police prowl car checks the street once about every 40 minutes, and they hit at 1.10 a.m., three minutes after the police had passed. Sounds professional. No, just a smart bunch of kids. The only fur they seemed to know was mink. They passed up a dozen or so chinchillas worth twice as much. How'd they get in? I don't know. Chrisman hasn't been able to tell us. They must have tricked him into opening the door. What about Chrisman's partner? He was making his rounds. They slipped up behind him, slugged him. He didn't see them. He didn't know what hit him. And nobody outside in the street saw anything? Saw them leave with the furs or anything? Nope. Or if they did, they're not saying anything. Oh, that's a rough one, Johnny. We haven't got a thing to go on. Except Chrisman here. The shape he's in, that's only a straw. If he recognized any of them, if he lives long enough to hide them. <laughs> At least the poor devil can groan. I don't know. I think he's closer to being conscious right now than he's been in the last hour. Maybe you're right. Chrisman? Order? He wants a drink. Yeah. Here you go. That enough? You want some more? Who are you? This is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator from Hartford. I'm Lieutenant Garcia, L.A. Police. The warehouse. The kids. It's all right now. You're in the hospital now. It's going to be all right. My... Do you feel like answering a few questions, Mr. Chrisman? It won't take long. Those kids, how did they get in? Telegram. Telegram? He showed me the telegram through the window. Yes. When I opened the door, one of them hit me. I... Did you get a look at the boy who showed you the telegram? Yes. I, I saw him. Yeah? Eighteen. Nineteen. What do you look like? Five, nine, ten. Dark skin, black hair. Uh -huh. how, how was he dressed? Dark jacket. Hard to think. Any scars? Anything unusual about him? No. <clears throat> My 
Yeah. Are you sure? Sure. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Yes. Any of the others? No. The only one. I, I, there was a mark on his arm. What kind of a mark? My... <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a mark on his arm? It's too bad. I, I, I... <sighs> well, that's that. Yeah, he's passed out again. Well, we got a description. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Right in that area, there are about 50,000 kids who fit it. I talked with Mr. Banley, owner of the Furs. Then Garcia and I went down to the warehouse. It stood on the fringe of the river bottom section, fronting the railroad yards and backed up by block after block of weather-beaten slum shacks. We looked through the warehouse, at the racks where the Furs had hung, watchman's office where the gang had entered, but knew while we did it that we were only going through the motions. The police technicians had already been over the place inch by inch, and they'd found exactly nothing. Finally, we stepped out the door into the street. A drab gray street, cluttered with things cast off and discarded. Dusty and hollow. There's the story of this whole district down here, Johnny. Right there in that street. Yeah. It's a backwash, a service yard. It's something you need, but don't like to look at, so you shove it out of sight. The people you need, but don't want around. It's the same with them. You grew up down here, didn't you, Garcia? Yeah, I grew up down here. That's why they gave me this case. I know this section inside out. And that's why I told you this one was going to be tough. I think I get the general idea. Those kids came from that slum there to the east. One gets you nine on that. The people who live there aren't on our side, Johnny. If they do know anything, they won't talk, is that it? They wouldn't tell a cop the time of day. I don't mean they're criminals. Most of them aren't. It's just that they always put themselves on the other side. What about juvenile gangs? Do they operate around here? Oh, dozens of them. And there's another thing. A few of these gangs are pretty rough, and people who might talk don't because they're scared to. Oh, it's a great setup, Johnny. A fine place to look for a hundred grand in furs. You know, I've been thinking about the fact that they knew exactly the time to hit. They must have staked out here somewhere. Sure, and probably right in the place you're thinking. Hey, that lunchroom across the street? Oh, they had to be inside, or the prowl car would have seen them. That's the only place open at night. Did you shake it down? Like I told you, Johnny... They won't give us the time of day. Uh-huh. What about me having a go at it? Yeah, maybe they wouldn't smell cop on you quite so strong. The owner's name is Red Wellers. He was on that night. See what you can get out of him if you want. I think I will. By the way, Johnny, I know you insurance guys make deals sometimes, no questions asked, just to get the loot back. Sometimes, yeah. Well, before you make any deal on this one, you better remember one thing. Chrisman made that. What do you say, Mac? Save your money. What do you want? Coffee? Yeah, I guess so. How's business? Bucket two a day. Father in the hole. Want cream? No, I'll drink it black. Want to sink it with it? No, thanks. Are you Red Willis? So that's it. What do you mean? You're in a fur case, ain't you? Maybe. I thought you was the same one, but I couldn't be sure of seeing you across the street. You come up with that cop Garcia a while ago, didn't you? That's right. I'm an insurance investigator. Well, you come to the wrong address, mister. I don't know nothing about nothing. Who was in the lunchroom here just before the robbery? I don't remember. Any young kids here? No. It was all old men with long beards. I see. Ten cents for the coffee. Yeah, they got you real scared, haven't they? Haven't they? I don't know any of these. All right, look. You know Chrisman, the watchman over at the warehouse. He comes in. He didn't know any of these either. What about it? Nothing. Except he's dying. I'm at the Rokin's Hotel if you change your mind. Room 312, Johnny Dollar. Sorry? 
I don't see no use of me dying, too. Follow me, Mac. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, fear stalks the streets, closing the mouths of a sullen and suspicious people, terrifying a lonely girl, and bringing death in a dusty alley. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. May 7th, 1956, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Another sad story of juvenile delinquency back in the day. Thank you for making us a part of your day. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allow us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station. Miss a day? You don't have to miss a single show. All of our shows are available on demand at ClassicRadio.stream. That's ClassicRadio.stream. Stream our shows. Find lists of podcast sites where you can download our shows and stream them by podcast. You can also find our social media links. You can also find uh, information on building a classic radio collection of your own. And you can also buy me a copy like so many nice people have. The buy me a copy money that you give us at classicradio.stream goes toward us acquiring additional classic radio collections to bring you here and to also maintain our distribution channels. That's at classicradio.stream. Thank you for tuning in. Tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.